All right, this tutorial is how to flow in an LD round. Um, there are multiple ways to flow. This is probably the most effective, or at least that's what I found. Like I said, there are multiple ways. If you come up with a way that you're more comfortable with, I highly recommend doing that way. Um, but this way is really organized. It forces you to stay organized, which is really hard when you're stressed out and when you're um, kind of freaked out and around. So what we're going to do is we're going to go step by step as if we are actually in a round, both the preparations as well as um, how to flow during the round. So what you want to do before you walk into a round is have this flowed. The nice thing about LD is that you know what side you're on before you walk into the round. Um, so you know if you're affirmative and you know if you're negative. So you're able to pre-flow according to that. So in this situation, we're going to pretend like we're affirmative but I'm going to show um, you how to flow both the affirmative and the negative, which is essential regardless of what side you're on. So it can be applied to both whether you're on affirmative or negative. All right, so what you need to have done before you walk into the round is you should have your own case flowed on this exact setup. So um, we're gonna pretend we're affirmative. So let's say we are affirmative, and before we walk into the round, we need to have our value. Let's pretend our value is justice. Okay? Um, and then we would pretend our criterion is, um, I don't know, social contract. That doesn't even really make sense, but it's the only thing I can think of. Okay? And what helps, I mean on a piece of paper you're gonna have a lot more room than this, um, but on a piece of paper, if you can't remember how to explain your value and criterion, you can, of course, refer back to your actual case on paper, but some people do write a little description next to it. Okay? And then you're going to want to have your contention one tagline. And then your subpoint A and your subpoint B tagline as well. And your contention two, once again, the tagline and your tagline of A and B. Now the reason this is absolutely important is because a lot of the times if you uh, read it slightly too fast or if your opponent is uh, flowing pretty slowly in cross-examination, they're going to ask, what was your subpoint A of your first contention? And instead of looking back on your first case, you can simply read it off the flow. Now what you want to be able to do is go back to your case as little as possible after the constructive speech just so it doesn't look like you're shuffling papers a lot. Now, of course, it's okay to go back if they ask you about a specific piece of evidence or anything like that, but if you have what you need on your flow, you'll be able to use that and it'll take your eyes off the paper and to the judge, which will make you an effective debater. So then, um, the next speech is going to be the negative constructive. Well, technically, the next speech is going to be, sorry, uh, the cross-examination, but you don't really need to flow the cross-examination. The cross-examination uh, does require you to take a couple notes based on their responses because the point of cross-examination, of course, is to uh, clarify the debate, pin down your opponent in a specific belief that you both share or even trap them. So, of course, it is important to take notes of um, that, of what's going on in the cross-examination, but in the beginning stages of debate, I, I, you do not have to write it directly on your flow. Um, however, later on, what I usually do when you become a little bit of an advanced debater is write them right here in the ending. So then if you do have anything that you want to bring up, you'd be able to refer it back to over here. All right, and so the next speech after the cross-examination, so the, the second actual speech that requires to be flowed is the negative constructive. So we're going to use the color red, and it is really important to use different colors because that helps you follow your line of logic. And just to kind of clarify, these two boxes, these two boxes, and these two boxes are the same speeches. They're just where or how to bring things up. All right? So in the next actual speech, it's going to be the negative constructive. Now, in the negative constructive, because it's a longer speech, that it being seven minutes long, you're going to want to spend four minutes on your own case, or at least three and a half, and three and a half to four minutes, um, sorry, three and a half to three minutes on the ref refutation against the affirmative case. So that's what's going to go in this box. So, as Ned, we'd present a value of justice as well. 
and then we present some kind of criterion that I can't think of. Right, and then the first value, tagline, subpoint A tagline, subpoint B tagline. Second contention, subpoint A tagline, subpoint B tagline. You don't need to put anything else. Um, sometimes a lot of people add whether they agree with the definitions, they check mark them either on their case or they check mark them on the actual flow itself. Um, I did not because I write very large and so I like to have lots of room, but if you have small handwriting, you use larger paper or that's really important to you, you can of course slip in like a little checkbox right here to make sure that you agree with their definitions just to make you or force you to listen to their definitions really carefully. Now in this same speech, you wouldn't sit down, you would simply continue on and say, um, here's my case, now here are my refutations against their case. So in the same speech, you would refute their case. So this is how you would flow it. Um, when, in, your prep, in your prep time, of course, because when you're on the negative, so let's switch sides and pretend we're the negative right now, this would technically already be flowed when you walked into the room. So after the affirmative has presented their case and you had done cross-examination, you would then say, is it alright if I take a moment to have, or may I have some prep time? Can I take some notes for a minute? And then you would refute, or you would write down your reputations against their case. Now let's, let's fast forward a little bit and pretend you're actually in the round. So you give your case, and then you move on to the refutations that you previously wrote down when you were using your prep time. So you would always, always start off by refuting their value and their criteria, because that's what LD is about. You would say their value of justice does not uh, fit this resolution or they do not actually uphold the value of justice, whereas my case does, and you would present reasons for why. So refutation, refutation, and then you would want to specifically hit their contentions. So contention one, subpoint A, subpoint B. It is okay to group them if the subpoint A and the subpoint B are very similar. For example, let's say their subpoint A and their subpoint B have basically the same uh, tagline, they're just slightly different wording, and they have a slightly different definition of something, or they have a slightly different example. You could just say, to group subpoint A and subpoint B, I offer the reputation of blah. In, in case that they are different, though, you would definitely want to make sure you hit every subpoint. And the reason these arrows are important is because you want to make sure that you are actually talking about them. You want to make sure that they were actually mentioned so you don't forget anything. I have seen some debaters actually cross it out. Not enough so they can't read it anymore, but just as a check mark to say, yes, I refuted all of these. But that's not absolutely essential. It's just to make sure that everything was mentioned and everything was brought up. All right. And so this is the same speech right here. This is one speech, these two boxes, you would be flowing them as if they're one speech. All right, now the second technical speech, after the cross the second cross-examination, it's going to be the affirmative talking. Now once again, these two boxes are one speech. The reason they're split up is because it's supposed to literally flow, the arguments flow. So all the arguments that are brought up over here flow this way and all the arguments brought up over here flow that way and then you ultimately result You'll die. in win oh ow, ow, ow. <laughs> go away now i have to start over no. all right so the next speech is going to be the affirmative rebuttal so once again these two boxes are the same speech so the affirmative would begin by refuting the negative's value give the reason then they would move on to refute the uh, negative's criterion, give a reason. Then just like you did, as if you were the affirmative, um, you would then give the reason for why that contention doesn't stand or why it's wrong in every single subpoint. even. Once again, you can group them if they are really similar, but only if they're really similar. You want to make sure you hit as many points as you possibly can in that time allotted. Let's say we do check it off, just to make sure. And then in that same speech, once again, this is a four minute speech. Um, so in this four minute speech, it is gonna be a little bit hard to manage your time, but the best debaters are able, no, 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 no. So in the same speech, you would also want to refute their reputations against yours. I know that sounds a little bit confusing, 
but time management is really important. So you'd want to spend two or three minutes on re um, refuting their case, and then a minute to two minutes refuting their refutations against your case. Because you want to have a good offensive as well as defensive, just like you would in a sport um, or in a board game. So you would say, they said this against my case or my value of blah blah blah, but that's not true because of blah. They said this against my criterion, um, but that's also not true because of blah. And then you want to do that for every subpoint and every contention. Now a really good debater has a few uh, extension evidence pieces pre-written in their case. Obviously you wouldn't say it when you present your case, but you want to have that so you have a piece of evidence to add. Not a new point because it is not allowed to bring up a new uh, actual point or actual contention, but it is okay to add new evidence to a pre-existing contention, and that strengthens your case. So for your contentions, it is always a good idea to have those examples or those that evidence. Now, let's say you have a value um, of justice, and they said, my case actually upholds justice better because of blah. So once again, you would want to say, they said this, but that's not true. My case actually does uphold value. And then you want to, you want to be thorough. All right, and then the next speech is going to be negative. All right, so this is negative's last speech. Negative only has two speeches. And this one is going to be a rebuttal speech as well as a voter speech. So in this uh, <clears throat> speech, you'd probably want to spend anywhere from three to four minutes um, summarizing the, the entire debate and bringing it down to its final most important points. So some debaters go by every single point and say, this is not true, this is not true, this is not true, this is not true, this, none of this is true. Um, and then they go by point by point, but the best debaters find a few solid reasons of why this debate has come down to these two or three points, um, or even this one point. Those are the best debates, and those debates have the best clash, and a judge is looking for the best clash. So, um, the neg, or in this case, yeah, the neg would say, this is what the debate has come down to, is these two, three, four points. And so, in a sense, how you would flow this is this. You just pick out the really important pieces. And you would say, they said this, this is the first clash. But once again, in this second speech, in the second speech of the, of the negative, you want to bring in the value and the criterion. The value and the criterion should always be talked about in every single speech. So you would want to say, this debate has come down to this, which is who has the better value. Um, so in this instance, they both have the same value, and so you would say, who upholds this value better? So this must be talked about no matter what speech you're doing. So this would be the first important point. The second important point would be their first contention against your second contention because they clash so well. So that's how we'd want to spend this time. And in that same speech, you'd want to spend the last two or three minutes simply talking about something called voters. Now, voters are a short way of saying voting issues, which is basically why you should win. So the reason they're called voting issues is because those are the things that the judge is going to vote on. The, the reasons of why which side has won or who did a better job of what. In the last couple of minutes of my speech, I will be giving voters or reasons why my side has uh, presented a better argument or ultimately won. Um, so you would want to pre-flow this by taking some time or some prep time out and have this. You do not want to impromptu this part. You can sort of impromptu it once you get better at it, but you should take the prep time to write every single one of these rebuttal speeches out. Do not impromptu it. Make sure you have it filled out in a box because your, your goal is to be able to use your flow as a reference while you're giving this impromptu speech. So, like I said, you would have this pre-flown out when you stand up to speak, you'd be reading this, and you'd say, my second voter is the fact that in their cross-examination, they admitted this, which is the core of the debate, therefore they submit to my side. So you'd give these really core, important, essential reasons of why your side has won. So once again, these are the same speech. If that helps you, you can always draw these little arrows.
and even write like a brief description the first time you're debating. After the second, the third time you're debating, sometimes the fourth, if you don't stay consistent with how you're flowing, you will have this down and you will remember which box is for what. And then this last box right here is going to be for the last affirmative speech. Once again, you should take the prep time to fill in what you're going to say in this box. Now what this box is for is purely voters, which is parallel to this. Voters are basically ending, uh, ending contentions. Just like you do in an essay, you would have a conclusion that comes up with a final point that defines the entire essay. It's not a repeat of the, of the thesis. Um, usually in beginning levels of writing or beginning levels of essay writing, that's what the conclusion is. But in higher and advanced essays, um, you would present basically a slightly more developed version of your thesis. And that's exactly what voters are. So this is your, the conclusion of your um, debate. So you would say, the reason I'm still right is because of these three or four new reasons. And you would sum up why together the dialogue you guys have created has ultimately led you to win. All right, and then so this final box over here is blank. And the reason I do that, not a lot of people do that. In fact, I'm the only person I've met that has done that. Um, I use that for notes for me. Now, of course, you can have a second piece of paper on the side next to your flow just for small little notes or reminders. But I save this for something called a, uh, my, my voting checklist. And so in this checklist, I would have some basic questions, um, like just to remind yourself on what to ask. Sorry, I have terrible handwriting. What to ask your opponent or what to ask your judge in terms of who won. So my first question is always, did they answer all parts of the resolution? Did they answer the who, the what, the how? Um, were they able to come up with a cohesive argument that fit what the resolution was asking us to do? My second question, I'll have all of these written down on my example flow. The second question I always ask is, does their value actually measure the resolution? For example, uh, let's say you had a resolution about whether homework should be assigned um, in high school and your value is uh, cotton candy you would say their value doesn't actually measure the resolution. It doesn't fall in line with what we're discussing. And while that may not seem like a very accurate question because nobody is going to be dumb enough to have that ridiculous of a contention or sorry, a value, the reason that is important is because that's a, a way for you to bring up my value fits the resolution better. My value actually addresses what we're talking about and therefore mine's more important. Now the third one is also a question you want to ask yourself, not in the debate, but when you're making your value and criterion. That should be, does yours slash their criterion match their value? Because the point of a criterion is to measure the value that it's under. If it doesn't measure it, therefore it doesn't exist. So you want to make sure that you ask the judge that. Does their criterion actually measure their value? And if it does, don't ask that to the judge. These questions are only something you should bring up if they fail to do so, which is why it's a checklist. So if they do answer parts of the resolution, you, you check it off and you don't have to bring it up. Um, if their value measures the resolution, you check it off, you don't bring it up. And then if their criterion measures their value, you check it off and you don't mention it. You only want to mention things that your opponent uh, failed to do or neglected to do, not things that they actually accomplished. Um, then I bring up any cross-examination questions that worked. So if they fell into a trap, if they admitted something that was really important to my side, I would bring that up because a lot of people, in fact, 90% of judges um, say that they will vote for you if you bring that up. That's all you have to do because so many debaters don't do that. So if you remember to do that, if you write a little note on it and you write down things that they admit and you bring that up, you have already gone one step above most debaters. So this may look really sloppy. I'll have another um, cleaner version set out for you uh, to look off of and to, to refer back to. But we were just following exactly what you would do in a debate situation. And I hope this was helpful.